Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light, a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. Today we're talking about grooming your doodle. My guest today is another trainer that specializes in cooperative care, but as she's a former full-time groomer, she only focuses on cooperative care training as it pertains to grooming. And let me tell you, doodles need a lot of grooming. This episode is less about cooperative care and how to train it. I've got an episode with the awesome Sarah McLaudry on that, but more about what kind of care your dog and especially your doodle needs. My guest is going to share some really practical tips with us and tell us all about her program where she will train you to train your dog to love grooming. Please welcome Tara Oster. Welcome to the podcast, Tara. Hi, Susan. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to talk about doodles because they're everywhere. Yeah, Yeah, I see a lot of doodles and they're very popular. I mean, I was a groomer and I've been a trainer, so I see them on all fronts and they're all over. But they're great dogs, so I can totally see why. Yeah, they absolutely can be great dogs. But what they're not is low maintenance. No, I agree with you. Um, I mean, even when I was like really into grooming and I was actually like grooming full time, I mean, we saw poodles um, or doodle poodle mixes all the time. And it was it was the same broken record situation where five or six grooms in with a new client, they began to realize this was way more at work than they than they thought or even just giving them a little bit of homework or explaining to them the maintenance schedule for their dog, it became clear. They're like, this is a lot. So what is it about these dogs? What's so different about their hair and their fur that makes them so much work? Um, I think that that's a couple things. I mean, there are different degrees of the type of hair. I, I, I don't exactly know all the levels of the doodles now. I mean, gosh, there could be more, but I know that there's different generations of doodles, which could imply that they have a different type of coat texture. Um, I think in the really beginning of doodles coming to be known as, you know, dogs that people could get, they had that like wiry, loose terrier looking coat. And I think that was just like the first generation, just mixing a lab with a poodle. And it, it was a really easy coat to manage, but they shed, they did shed a lot. And now we see that super tight, dense, curly hair that is nearly impossible to manage. And I think that what makes, you know, this hair so different is that there's a wide range of what people could see if they get a doodle. There's a huge range of coat um, textures, thickness, Uh, color when they get a doodle. And I think that also comes down to the doodle isn't just a poodle in a lab. It's a poodle in a Bernese, a poodle in a a Havanese, a poodle. And uh, there's so many mixes that they could have a bajillion different coat combinations. And we already know that even purebred dogs that have been around for quite a long time can have some variations in their coat thickness texture and such. So now that we have this doodle, which is a like single label for a wide variety of different dog combinations, it's just, I think it's so overwhelming and a lot of information for anybody who's looking to get one. And the problem is they see one somewhere. That's where it happens. I mean, the reason I wanted my dogs was because I saw one somewhere and I was really attracted to it. So I know from experience as a trainer and a groomer, that when someone sees a doodle, they want one. So then they reach out to someone to get one, and they're not going to get what they saw. Or possibly they got what they saw, but didn't know how much work was going to go into that coat, right? I had a doodle that I groomed, and she was like 16. She was a, a big doodle, and she had that wiry terrier coat that was very sparse and thin, And I think it was just because she was like 
a poodle bred with a lab and it was i think it's the lab but the golden doodle is where it really gets that thick high maintenance because you're you're blending a double coat with a curly coat and i think that if i'm correct the the um the coat of a doodle that was bred with golden has a mixture of single follicle curly hair and double coated curly hair. Can you define what you mean when you say double coated? Um, double coated breeds have more than one hair follicle uh, per like, you know, pore. And that could be, you know, between two to seven hairs is what I remember reading when I was in grooming school. So that's why, like, even within the Huskies, you can have a woolly Husky and you can have, you know, just your double coated Husky. You can have a long haired Husky and a short haired Husky. Um, but even among all of those, they all have a double coat. It's just, it's just even more variation. That's really fascinating. I don't think I realized that Golden Retrievers had a double coat. And then that, you know, that makes a lot of sense now why golden doodles have the hair that they do. It makes a lot of sense. So I have to ask you about this myth. Uh, I have heard, or I feel like it's a myth, but I'm asking you, I heard that if you, you should not cut a doodle's hair before they're a year old, because if you do, it will never grow right for the rest of their life. That's not true. Yeah. And waiting until that long can have really huge behavior issues for the dog and in in the grooming context. If they wait until they're a year old, they have completely missed their socialization period, conditioning them to the grooming sounds. And when we say haircut, they don't have to be shaved, although it's very common to end up shaving your dog at a young age anyway, because number one, they're not easy to brush when they're little and Guardians have a hard time getting to a lot of things. So uh, trying to avoid the shave just because you're worried that it's going to ruin their hair, it doesn't really hold up anywhere. Their their hair keeps growing, just like people hair. Um, like you said, they, it's going to grow back. Um, now, the double-coated dogs, if you shave them, it will not grow back quite the same. Um and especially if you shave them repeatedly, like at any age, if you shave a double coated dog, you may see that it doesn't grow back as thick or it's much more uh, mismanaged. Um, so saying that a poodle mix or a doodle can't have their hair cut until they're a year old. I, I think that just really comes from the prestigious show, you know, world where they want to preserve that puppy coat. And you also want to remember that show dogs aren't being, you know, altered or spayed or neutered either. And whenever you spay and neuter a dog um, as a pet, that changes their hormones. And so then their coat texture changes. And that's a lot of times where there's a point at a dog's young age where it either becomes really difficult to brush them because their coat texture is changing. And they also, it's not uncommon for them to be sensitive to it. So they cry out more or they um, struggle against the brushing because because they're puppy coat. So I personally, I would just do a shortcut while they're young, help them through their brushing stage, and then let them be a little longer when they're older. But that's me personally. Everybody's entitled to do what they want with their groomer, so long as it's going to work for their dog and they're able to keep up with it. Okay. I just want to ask a, a clarifying question because you said you don't want to shave a double coated dog, but it's okay to shave a poodle, but they might have uh, the double coat if they inherited it from one of their parents. So I'm a little confused. They have a mix. No, it's not the same because um, the purebred double coated dogs that have that top guard coat and the, the thick woolly undercoat, when you shave those, you are allowing both of those coats to grow in together. And so the undercoat can Oh, because then they'll grow yeah, at the same time yeah, like, and they're not um, meant to be the same length. Yeah, ah, I okay. A... Yep. I gotcha. I'm with you now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. And then I think it's very interesting what you said about uh, the puppies hitting a very sensitive age. I want to talk a little bit more about puppies. What age should a puppy get their first bath? 
Oh my gosh. I love working with little puppies. I loved when I was a groomer and I got a new puppy um, because I, I would give them, you know, kind of like the rundown of what to do, but they should get their first bath immediately. It's so like, as soon as you get your puppy, I would do a once a week exposure to bath time and they could just, you know, lick some peanut butter off the side of the tub with the bath, like having an inch of water, but using the bathroom as a more frequent area to have positive experiences, especially in the bathtub, um, do these baths, these like practice baths often when they're little and they can have their first bath anytime they're dirty. When a puppy is coming home, it's pretty common for potty training to be an issue. And I don't know about you, but for anybody that has raised a puppy knows that they will get pee on themselves at some point. So give the puppy a bath. And if they have like that once a week or twice a week, little piddle paddle around inside the tub with an inch of water, it makes that first bath with soap a lot easier for them. And I will say that you have to, have to, have to dilute your shampoo. Um, so using a mixing bottle is one of those like industry secrets that anybody that washes their dog at home is not doing because they just don't know about it. Um, so I would even tell people to just save a water bottle that has a squirt top that they got at the gas station or go to Walmart and buy like a um, condiment bottle. But you will buy your puppy shampoo and put a tiny squirt in there, but the rest is water and you shake it up. And it's su supposed to be very diluted and really thin because when you give your puppy a bath, it'll rinse out very quickly and very easily. And then you're preserving your shampoo. You're not spending extra time rinsing them. And I think that if the bath is longer than it should be or more vigorous than it should be, that could be something that makes them struggle with it emotionally or have a negative experience. But in, you know, to round out this answer, give your puppy their first bath right away and make it a regular part of their life. I love that. And what age can they get a, a grooming from a professional groomer? This is different for every groomer. Um, but most groomers do have like a puppy package program, whatever you want to call it, or it's basically a puppy schedule. And what I really, really liked to do was get puppies whenever they were, you know, between 10 to 12 weeks after their shots are kind of done and just have them come in for a, you know, spa day where they got a bath and they just got to be with us. So as a groomer, we would give them a a puppy bath and usually I would do their nails while mom or dad or their guardian held them at drop off. So it's like the first thing they do when they got there was um, instead of just giving me their puppy and leaving, I would say, why don't you hold them and I'll do their nails. This is when they're really little. And usually the guardian will hold a treat or something they can lick. And that way the nails are done and out of the way. They get their bath they would go into a crate with a blanket, a bowl of water, and we would usually do like air drying with a fan and they would just chill and relax. This is like a great introduction to grooming for puppies, no matter what kind of dog you have. But doodles are going to see their groomer every four to six weeks. I know groomers because I was in the industry as a groomer. I still know groomers who require their doodles stay on a f uh, like four or six week schedule or they cannot continue to come. Mm -hmm. They'll be a mess. And why will they be a mess if we go longer than four to six weeks? Is it because we're not brushing them enough at home? Well, from my experience, I have a Chinese crested powder puff, which is not a doodle. And the coat type is nothing like a doodle. My dog has that long straight hair. And if I don't bathe her once a week, She's matted somewhere by two weeks. And so brushing actually becomes an aversive because the brushing is occurring after mats are formed. So that is, that's where it becomes a problem. You're right. 
so brushing isn't happening, no, but it's because they're not getting a bath and a blow dry frequently enough. The bath and blow dry, and this is this is what I really teach in my program, is the bath and blow dry is just as important as the brushing. I know that you hear brushing harped by your groomer, but that's because your groomer doesn't think you're going to be in the position to or want to bathe and dry your own dog. And I think that that is something that dog guardians could do more of at home too. And it may remove some of the stress and the overwhelm of brushing because they already know brushing is hard for their dog and bathing and drying also needs to be conditioned positively. Um, so yeah, as far as how often to brush or, or if brushing isn't happening enough, I think that it depends on that coat type. Like we talked about in the beginning, it really depends on what kind of hair your doodle has and what type of brush, because that's really important. I, I think that the type of tools you use can make it last longer or be more work than it needs to. What's the best kind of brush? Does it depend on the type of dog, the type of coat? It would depend on what your groomer shows you, but I want to point out that slicker brushes are best when there's already mats. Um, Using a long pin brush can be a great step one. And then step two could be a wide tooth comb. And any place your wide tooth comb gets stuck, you need to locate the mat and then use a slicker brush only on the mat. Does that make sense? Yep, that makes sense to me. I will put a link to a slicker brush in the show notes. Um, not as it like a recommendation, but just in case you're listening and you don't know what we're talking about, I'll put a link in the show notes. And on that note, we are going to take a quick break. Tara, will you tell people a little bit about uh, the program that you offer your clients? That's sort of your specialty. Uh, yeah. So if, if you need to know more about the fearless grooming program or a little bit of what is taught or what experience other dog guardians have, please go to my Instagram. It's at Zen dog period fearless grooming. And there's lots of story highlights and I've got lots of posts and um, content there about what we do in the program. All of Tara's links are in the show notes. We'll be right back guys. There's lots of different types of slicker brushes. There is short slicker brushes and long slicker brushes. There's like you know, sparse slicker brushes and there's dense slicker brushes and you need the right kind for your dog's hair. And I also will tell you that slicker brushes are not created equal. We groomers spend $60 or $50 on a brush for a reason Um, because I started out with cheap things and it just took more work. It took more work, which meant the dog was getting, you know, a little frustrated or aggravated with, with it quicker. But the way you use a slicker brush is important too, because you need to, like I said, isolate that mat. I usually will like hold it between my fingers and then it's either laying in my hand uh, so that I have fingers against the dog and the, the mat. And actually I'm kind of brushing into my hand, not even the dog. But if a mat is so close to the skin that you can't get your hands around it, it's going to have to be shaved off. And that is just so much easier for your dog anyway. Um, So yeah, that's my suggestion on what type of brush. So mats is like a dirty word uh, for doodle owners. Can you just talk a little bit about mats and what they are and what can and can't realistically be done with them? Well, yes, because there's like there's like a wide mat that is covering a large area or there's mats that are just at the ends of long hair. Like my little white dog, she has that long straight hair. So her mats could be just at the end of her like end of a section of hair. So what I do for those types of mats, if the hair is long and straight, um, cornstarch works really good. You can get a little bit of cornstarch and like sprinkle it on there and then just kind of like massage it apart. And you'll notice that the mat becomes broken up into smaller mats or it is a lot easier to brush through. But if the mat is like a dense, wide um, knot, 
you know, like over a flat area, it's just probably going to need to be shaved off. Yeah. And people get so upset when you shave their doodle that I just want to be really clear that like the groomers are not doing this to upset you or because they don't want to work on the mats. They're doing it because those mats are pulling on your dog's skin in a really painful way. And uh, it's a, it's a welfare issue at that point. You can do a lot of things before the haircut during bath time and during blow drying that can remove mats that will really save your dog's skin. So knowing that um, using a conditioner is going to be a really big secret too. I don't know if conditioners are even sold in the pet store. I think it's like shampoos or shampoo with conditioner together. Um, In my fearless grooming program, we also have a lesson on supplies, on grooming tools, on bathing products, because I want to tell all the secrets. <laughs> I want everybody to know you can go to this website or this website and order a gallon and you dilute it and it'll last you, you know, a long time or don't get a gallon. If you're not going to wash your dog a lot, you just get like a 32 ounce bottle, but always get the conditioner and the conditioner can either be diluted or semi diluted so that it's like more concentrated. And then you just squirt a bunch of conditioner on the mat and you let it soak for a few minutes. Um, maybe you do their nails at that time or you clean out their ears, um, you know, or you do something else or you can, you can literally just let it sit. But if the conditioner is able to work through that mat, the rinsing process and the blow drying process can break that mat up so that when they're dry, you're not brushing all the mats you started with. Maybe you're just brushing a few. So knowing that's an option could help a lot of doodle guardians because they could ask their groomer, what are you doing, you know, before the haircut to get mats out? Because I really would prefer you don't brush my dog for 35, 40 minutes. That's that's not really going to be the best for their skin. And I, I'm sure groomers would say that anyway. Like, oh, if it's taking more than 15 minutes to brush out 20 minutes, maybe it's not a good idea today. But again, groomers all have their own kind of like preferences and policies within the salons. Um, But I definitely would say that as a dog guardian, it's really tempting to let your groomer keep your dog's coat because they're saying that they can. But then at the end, like you said, they might realize, oh, my dog has brush burn Um, or my dog was, you know, it's pretty raw where they were brushed that much. But on the other hand, the groomer is doing what the guardian asked. So it's all about communication. Yes. Uh, communication is super important. And also it's important to really understand what your goals are. If your goal is you just want to hand someone your dog and get it back clean and fluffy, that's one thing, but your goal really should be. And I know your goal, Tara, with your clients is to take the time to make it as positive an experience as possible so that basically grooming is easier for the rest of that dog's entire life, as opposed to just getting through it today. Yeah, and not just harder on the dog, but harder on all the people that have to do it. And I know that because I saw it happen plenty of times. Um, I've seen certain situations where, you know, the person got to a point where they're like, your dog can't come here anymore because your dog is so difficult. They need to go somewhere where they can be sedated. And I think that that's, on one hand, the guardian was told that their dog needed help, but they weren't, no one was aware of what that help looked like. And that's why I made my program. I left grooming to make the fearless grooming program so that I could get people who were really interested in helping their dog cooperate for grooming, but because they want to, not because they're forced to. Okay. So what kind of grooming or husbandry care does every dog need across the board? Yeah, basic um, across the board, everybody should do is bathing, blow drying, brushing teeth, and brushing their coat, and doing their nails. Um, Some dogs need haircuts, some dogs don't. But Dogs like doodles, and this is kind of like an extra, hey, if you have a dog with a fuzzy face, they need to learn a chin hold. 
a chin hold is different than a chin rest. A chin hold is complying and accepting that someone is holding on to your face instead of just resting it. Like both my dogs have short face, uh, short hair on their face. I have a Husky and I have a Chinese crested and even like a German shepherd or an ostrich, there's no hair that grows on their chin. So the chin hold is preparing them for the groomer, which will hold their chin in order to scoop the eyes, um, which scooping the eyes is actually a grooming um, technique where you take a clipper and you just kind of like scoop the hair out of the corner of the eyes. So I didn't want to like leave everybody in the dark. Um, or some dogs don't really like the buzzing clipper near their face. So we use little scissors that um, can trim the hair right at the corner of the eye so that hair doesn't get in their eyeball and they can see. But during that Anything grooming around the face, the groomer will gently hold the hair on their chin just to stabilize them. And that could either turn into a slippery slope of I'm going to hold on to you no matter how hard you struggle against me. Or what I explain in my program is look for a groomer and ask them specifically, you know, if my dog struggles, what's your response? And we, you know, kind of talk through what they would expect their groomer. There's a lesson on how to choose groomers, what to um, listen for when you talk to your groomer, what questions to ask. That's all included in the program. Um, but for example, yeah, just that's one bonus thing. And also ear cleaning, ear shaving is important to doodles and poodles. They, there's a, there's mixed feelings about ear plucking. So I won't get into that, but I like to shave the hair around the ear canal, just like flip the ear open and just shave that away. Um, so helping your doodle or poodle mix get comfortable with clippers being near their ear canal or their cheeks is really important. One of the really big reasons for my program is that I wanted dog guardians to know that they're capable of doing more. They don't have to rely on their groomer to know everything and to do everything. I think that the fearless grooming program really educates dog guardians on what happens during grooming, what's required to perform grooming and what your dog experiences. That's a lot of information that is kind of not really known to them. It's kind of just hidden, but not purposefully. They just have to look for it. Um, my program teaches about all of that, but then we take it even further. Of course, the whole program teaches dog guardians how to feel comfortable and confident doing those things themselves and how to help their dog cooperate for it. And in the end, the dog guardians are so much happier because they can see their dog is happier, but they can actually feel good that their dog is not walking around with extra long nails. And we know that extra long nails is um, a health concern. Or they can actually look in their dog's mouth and inspect their teeth and look at their gums without worrying about spooking their dog or even getting bitten. Some dogs do, you know, struggle with that. They don't worry about their dog having ear infections. I've had several people reach out with you know, concerns that their dog gets chronic ear infections and they're like, I just need to be able to take care of this at home. Totally. Let's, let's get you in the program. Thank you, Tara, for joining me today. I learned a lot and I feel like I'm around doodles all day, every day. My biggest takeaways are comb with a wide tooth comb and anywhere that gets stuck, you have a mat and you, if you can get your fingers between your dog's skin and the mat, you may be able to brush it out with a slicker brush with good conditioner or some powder. But if it's closer to the skin than that, the mat needs to be shaved off. Also, even if your dog's mats can be brushed out, it may be a torturous process for the dog and for their sake, shaving might be more humane. The hair will grow back and you can practice proactively maintaining their coat as it grows. Also, yes, your doodle needs to be brushed often, but it actually needs to be washed and blow dried more often too. That will have a big effect on how many mats they have. And if all this grooming makes your dog really unhappy, reach out to a trainer like Tara who can help you train your dog to have a better overall experience with the grooming process. 
Thank you for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at doggydojopodcast.com or I'm Susan Light LA on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by Mac Light. You can find him at maclightsongwriter.com. If you like the show, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts. I'll be back in two weeks with another new episode of the Doggy Dojo. Thank you.